Bob Dylan, Blackbush Aerodrome, July the 15th, 1978. A Chancer's Tale. In 1978, Bob Dylan returned to the UK for the first time since the Isle of Wight Festival in 1969. He played six nights at London's Earl's Court from June the 15th to June the 20th. To try and get a ticket, unless you were minted or had great contacts, was impossible. Unless you had the money to buy off the scalpers or ticket touts, you had no chance. People camped outside the ticket outlets dotted around the country, up to 24 hours before they went on sale. The demand was so big that the UK promoter Harvey Goldsmith decided to put on an extra show at a deserted aerodrome 40 miles outside London. Where else? Dylan was going to be the headliner, Eric Clapton, Joan Armour Trading and Graham Parker and the rumour were support. Tickets for the gig were sensibly priced at £6, about $10. Trouble was, I didn't have six quid. I was broke. I was potless. In short, I was skint. But the Friday night before the gig, sitting in a quiet corner of the Hornsey Road Tavern, with my mate Pete over a long drawn out half pint, we devised a cunning plan. Pete was my best mate. We'd been through thin and thin together. Now, what's the best way to describe Pete? Well, Pete and his dad were buyers and traders, though a large part of their stock kept in various garages and lock-ups situated around North London, seemed to have mysteriously fallen off the back of various lorries. And all their transactions were conducted on a strictly cash-only basis. Peter had never really worked and lived off his wits and a vast reservoir of bullshit. We decided that there was no way this concert, this event, was going to pass us by. We were going to go. Come hell or high water, we were going to get in somehow. After all, had we not scaled the walls of Charlton Football Club to see the Who's classic concert there in 1974, had we not sneaked under the barriers at Shepherd's Bush to see Yes in 1975? So, pull in our resources... £2.50, pence, two cans of baked beans and one bottle of Pepsi. We set out bright and early that Saturday morning. Saying a prayer to the gods of rock, off we went. And like Jake and Elwood, we were on a mission. When we arrived at Waterloo Station, it was absolute bedlam. You had many people decked out in casual gear, jeans, t-shirts, etc. But then it seemed like you had Every freak, every stoner, space case and loon had descended on the station. The British Rail staff looked overwhelmed, a bit shocked at this thronging mass of festival goers. No one was ever, ever going to check any tickets. But fair play to the staff, they managed to marshal us on to various trains. And we were packed like sardines. But we continued onwards. Joints were passed around, and unlike a certain American present, I certainly did inhale. We arrived at a station called Fleet, and I can remember floating off the train, but I can't remember how I got to the aerodrome, but I do remember my first sight of the venue. Around the massive concert area, there constructed a 10 foot high corrugated metal fence. All around us, were thousands and thousands of people. More people than I've ever seen in one place. The news said 100,000 people were expected, but it was reported later that over 250,000, a quarter of a million people, turned up. Security was the tightest I've ever seen. If you didn't have a ticket, you weren't getting in. The area outside the fence was patrolled by packs of security guards. And any attempts to break through, get under, get around, get over the fence was met with force, let's say. We did several sweeps around the fence, several scouting missions, and concluded this was going to be a lot harder than we first thought. 
we came across an old acquaintance, Tit Willow, sitting cross-legged with an acoustic guitar. Willow went to every concert or festival. He never went in, just sat outside with his guitar, singing his songs about saving the planet, the futility of war, you know the stuff. He placed his hat nearby so passing peeps could show their appreciation. I peered into it. It was empty. Don't look like you're having a good day, Willow. Yeah, I thought someone put two bob in it earlier, but it was only a fucking peseta. Wankers. Poor Willow. He couldn't sing, he couldn't play, and his songs were pants. But we loved him. We sat down and we shared out our meagre provisions, our two cans of baked beans and our bottle of Pepsi, and listened to the sounds of Graham Parker and the rumour in the distance. As Bob would say, the hour was definitely getting late and we were no nearer in getting in. As we took our leave of Willow, I slipped a ten pence piece into the hat. We were getting nowhere fast, so we decided to skirt round and get behind the stage. So after crossing several ploughed fields, we found ourselves next to an access road going into the artist area behind the stage. But again, the security was watertight. There was a line of vans and lorries all waiting to go into the arena. Walking past one of the vans, a large balding man leant out of his cab. Oi, all right boys? You look like you've lost a quid and found a tanner. I replied, we're trying to get in to see Bob Dylan. He's not my cup of tea. Give me Perry Como or Johnny Mathis any time. Now that's real music. Bob Dylan? The geezer can't even sing properly. But I tell you what, you want to get in? Jump in the cab. Help me unload and I'll leave you in there. Bosh, job done. Once you're in there, it shouldn't be too difficult to get in to see the show. I want to get back to see the cricket match on the TV. It's a test match. The man's name was Bob and he was as good as his word. We drove in, passed the security guards, unloaded his supply of booze, shook our hands and he told us one more time we should really be listening to better music. Off he went and left us to wander around the great and the good. We felt like we had walked into some decadent Roman orgy without sex. That may have come later. Food and drink was everywhere. We saw Billy Connolly, Jenny Agata, Ringo, Bianca Jagger, everyone and their uncle was there. And it was a long, long way from cans of cold baked beans and a bottle of warm Pepsi. Pete whispered in my ear, just act like you belong here. And we ate and we drank to our heart's content. Billy Connolly was holding court and he was brilliant. Doing what amounted to a one man show. And it was so funny. The man was a comic genius. Eric Clapton arrived in a helicopter and had a Rolls Royce ferry him from the helicopter site to the backstage area, a distance of about 200 yards. Around about half past seven, the mood changed and there was definitely a buzz in the air and you knew it wouldn't be long before Mr Dillon took the stage. We thought if we mixed with the celebrities throwing into the sides of the stage, this would be pushing our luck a little too far. But what we'd noticed in front of the stage was a special area for the press. To get there, all you had to say to the people guarding the area was press and you were allowed in. So that's what we did. Turning round, I gazed back to the 250,000 plus crowd. And we'd done it. By a little bit of blagging, a little bit of ball, we'd made it. And we were going to be about 20 yards from one of Rock's greatest ever performers guy standing next to me said who are you with the penzance inquirer i replied we're doing an in-depth piece on dylan and his effect on contemporary folk music in the southwest of england directly behind me was a bunch of let's say about 20 blokes slightly inebriated let's say and they were singing woodstock with slightly changed lyrics by the time we got to blackbush we were off our swedes we are drunk we are stoned and we've got to find our way back to the boozer. What can I say about Bob Dylan? He was just mesmerising, backed by a huge band of 11 musicians and singers. Somehow he conducted them through three hours and five minutes of mind 
blowing music. At times, Dylan's band came over like the biggest bar band in the world. They were very, very loose. Dylan's top hat that he got from a doorman at Savoy that morning was very apt. He led the band like a cosmic ringmaster. For all of that three hours plus, he kept us enthralled. Pulling out one great song after another and one great performance after another. Anyone who wants to hear that performance, I'm going to post a link to the bootleg of that performance in the description of the video. Near the end of the show, the stagehands, Dylan's stagehands, were shouting at him to bring the show to a close, as Harvey Goldsmith was worried about being sued for noise pollution by the local residents. Dylan, though, was having the time of his life and would have played all night if it was possible. One of the memories that stays with me about that fantastic gig is turning round and looking back at that vast crowd as Dylan was singing The Changing of the Guards. 16 years, 16 banners united over the field and seeing hundreds of banners waving in the night sky. So that was it. I've managed to get into one of the most legendary gigs in UK rock history. The only downside, I was now behind 250,000 people making their way home. I don't recall how we got home. I woke up at 9am on a Sunday morning on a deserted train in a siding at Woodgreen British Rail Station. The world around me was deserted and very, very peaceful. Sunday morning quiet. It was only a short slide down the embankment to my home. Putting on the kettle, I checked my pockets. The whole day had cost me 50 pence. Result. Thanks for listening. I'll see you guys next video. Stay safe, stay well. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Take good care. Bye.